Valley Tribune podcast. In this episode, uh, we'll attempt to answer the question posed by our regular reader, Han Fei. As question is uh, not overly long, I'll read it in its entirety. Han Fei asks, I was wondering if you could publish a critical commentary on Colin Cleary's series of five articles published on Countercurrents titled Heidegger's History of Metaphysics. In these series of articles, Cleary attempts to map out the causes of the current cultural and intellectual disaster of the Western world, the blame for which he lays upon the shoulders of intellectual positivism, that is to say Western philosophy's attempt to abstractly define and circumscribe every aspect of spiritual and intellectual life. Rejecting Christianity as a cultural foundation for the European world, he seeks answers in the primeval runic esotericism of the Germanic North. I would like to say that I am extremely concerned about the growing anti-Christian and Promethean tendencies among the dissident right, so-called, intellectuals uh, in the West. Uh, the sheer degree of frustration and indignation elicited by life in Western society has a strong tendency to prompt people to seek solutions in the darker areas of knowledge and political ideology. I believe these sentiments should not be dismissed, but whenever possible, addressed and proved, provided with an alternative. End quote from Han Fei. Now, as this is a very concise request and very comprehensible. Unfortunately, it requires more than one episode of this question and answer session, so there will be two episodes. There was no other way I could address this uh, in a proper manner. And this first episode will be uh, rather an introduction into the state of current uh, understanding of Heidegger's philosophy in uh, in contemporary academia uh, and uh, some uh, I would say uh, shocks uh, that uh, that happened to mainstream Heideggerians in the university and not only Heideggerians but people academics influenced by Heidegger and they are a legion both on the left and the right, although those on the right don't really have have much say in academia anymore. Uh, the second part will be going into details, but I must say in advance, I read uh, Cleary's uh, essays. Uh, and if I would go to uh, passage by passage commentary, uh, that would take too long. I just cannot cannot perform perform it in this uh, in this fashion. And I generally, when it comes to criticism, <coughs> excuse me, of what other people think, I prefer putting forward uh, something positive in a sense that I put forward an affirmative statements that contradict their statements. And from justification of my affirmative statement, I hope to show how uh, their stance is wrong. So this is not what you would call deconstruction, as is now very popular. <clears throat> this is the word that is often uh, used as a synonymous uh, with criticism, but it is anything but. And it is a word that we, to a large degree, I think, owe to Heidegger himself, although he would prefer the expression destruction. So I won't go into uh, much into Cleary. I must say this in, in advance. Uh, I will rather, in the second episode, pick one passage his interpretation of Heidegger that I will show to be completely right in the sense that he is uh, very, uh, I think, correct in understanding Heidegger, but in the context of philosophy and in the context of what Heidegger is doing to philosophy, they are both catastrophically wrong. 
Uh, in this first episode, as I said, I'll rather go into giving a general outline where Heidegger stands now. And this is very important for one reason. These Promethean uh, tendencies nurturing people of whom Humphrey speaks, among who, whom there is a species of uh, so-called white nationalists, seem to be quite uh, apt interpreters of Heidegger. The reason why I say this is the rucus that is still raging in mainstream academia, if I could use such an umbrella term, for a very large institu- uh, large body of institutions throughout Europe and, jo- and Americas. Uh, the rucus that was caused by uh, finishing touch of uh, publishing ha- Heidegger's so-called Gesamtsausgabe. Gesamtsausgabe are, of course, Heidegger's collected works that were being published by his publisher Vittorio Klesterman uh, from the early 70s, if I'm not mistaken, from 1973. Heidegger was still alive uh, when this work was commissioned. And he had a hand in directing the sequence of works to be published. This means that Heidegger's collected works are in a way uh, a kind of continuation of Heidegger's philosophy, posthumously. Because Heidegger thought that uh, he is not indulging in works, but in uh, walking the paths, as he says, Wege uh, nicht werke, that means roads, not works. He is the thinker on the way, whatever that means. Uh, this doesn't mean only that Heidegger doesn't create philosophical systems, he doesn't do a lot of other things that traditionally philosophers used to do, not only modern, but precisely uh, philosophers of antiquity and Middle Ages. Uh, This also means that you can understand Heidegger only by going the same way he goes, following him on the way and perhaps wandering off at some point. I wandered off rather early and never looked back except in the cases where somebody like Humphrey asks me a question about Heidegger and then I take a peek at what, what's new on Heideggerian highway. Well, Gesamtausgabe, uh, as I understand, finished and completed by uh, publication of so-called Schwarze Hefte or Black Notebooks. Black Notebooks are... Heidegger's diaries that were written mostly from the late 20s to mid 50s. And they contain Heidegger's most intimate thoughts. That is to say, Heidegger, uh, the things that Heidegger was, didn't feel that should uh, should be publicly spoken or written. Although to a large extent, they correspond to a phase in the Heidegger's philosophic, public philosophical work that was supposedly very short and one-time offering. Now, what I mean by this? In 1933, Heidegger, as a representative elect of uh, uh, National Socialist Deutsche Partei, was elected... Uh, um, was elected rector of Freiburg's university. And on that occasion, he held uh, his inaugural speech, so-called Rektorede, or in German, Die Selbst Behauptung der Deutsche Universität. Now, most of Heidegger's followers, uh, even Heidegger's critics, who nevertheless built upon Heidegger's main intuition of the destruction of Western metaphysical tradition, and others uh, tried to interpret these 
Heidegger's outing as a one-time case of Heidegger stumbling, stumbling upon a on quite sizable bottle of stupid pills. Namely, in their in, in prevalent opinion was that Heidegger just had a had a had a accidental uh, lapse of reason. First of all, by uh, joining and supporting uh, Nazi party at all. A second of delivering speech that is uh, the, whose pomposity, whose obscurity and obscurantism, whose unbashed praise uh, to uh, Führer of German Reich, and uh, general style of delivery are so beneath him that it seems almost as if somebody else wrote this and Heidegger was made to read it. <clears throat> well, this was uh, a common opinion uh, even when I was a student uh, back in the 90s. That is to say even before because I read uh, books of some Croatian philosophers uh, in, that wrote in the 70s about this. This was a, a prevailing opinion. However, with a publication of black notebooks, the first thing that strikes one who reads them, especially if you take trouble of reading the original German, because a lot, a lot of gets lost in translation in English, uh, the first thing you, you are struck with is that uh, the language of notebooks and language uh, of rector's rede are very, very similar. It is quite obvious that they were written in the same spirit. And as I said, Heidegger's most intimate thoughts now published as his crowning achievement, uh, he intended them to be published as a kind of introduction in his philosophy, because with Heidegger, introduction is always at the end of the way, if we may call it, if the way ever ends. But if it ends, it terminates with an introduction. You come to the end and then he introduces you, don't ask. <laughs> I'll try to explain this. There is a rationale for it. This is not... He likes to, to couch this in, 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 in a fancy fancy words but uh, th th there is a logical structure to, to what he attempts and it's not that original I think uh, as most people think about him when they think about him uh, so Schwarze Hefte or Black Notebooks are in fact uh, quite congenial with Rector's Rede therefore they are quite congenial with Heidegger's one time lapse of reason it's, it seems that Heidegger's lapse of reason was something that he carried throughout his life perhaps even that all of the Heidegger's philosophy could very well be one long because he lived a long life lapse of reason now <clears throat> this uh, caused rucus, obviously, and it's delicious rucus, and I cannot help uh, but confess that I enjoyed, in preparation to this podcast, listening to lectures on internet and debates uh, published on internet, academic debates about issue, about the issue mostly of Heidegger's anti-Semitism, because there are some anti-Semitic statements in black notebooks uh, that obviously are systemic or intrinsically uh, intrinsically tied to Heidegger's very thought. So anti-Semitism in a very specific way, I will say a few words about it, although there are not many of those passages, there are enough to, to cause outrage. And why am I so happy about it? Because, you know, those academics who thought that they get Heidegger, that they understand him or that, they are, that he is their man, were right to an extent. They were right to an extent that Heidegger's project was destruction of uh, Western philosophy, on the one hand, that is supposed to, that this is his rationale, uh, let the origin shine through, that is 
been somehow veiled or hidden by people like Platon, Aristotle. I won't even start to talk about people who he rarely mentions, like Plotinus, Thomas Aquinas, and others. Uh, now those people can see that they should see, they can see, but they obviously don't, that there's something wrong with this, and there is something wrong with them. Because their maestra, their philosophical teacher, was a committed national socialist. Moreover, he was not a national socialist in the way of uh, Sturmabteilung or later SS uh, or Hitler or, or Rosenberg. He was a more subtle and more advanced kind of national socialist, that is to say, the man who understood that national socialism is not a one-time offering, but that it is a form of political breakthrough, Durchbruch, as he would say, that prepares the political climate to an advent of the essence of Heidegger's philosophy, which is nevertheless not identical with it. Heidegger's philosophy, that is to say, Heidegger, as he would like to call Heidegger's thinking, because he tries to reject the term philosophy altogether, uh, is something far more radical. A radical in a way that you cannot really explain systematically, because all the bets are off. However, you can conjecture from the... Uh, from the fact that he accepts national so, uh, national socialism as uh, congenial to his thought, whereas he rejects all else as not congenial to his thought, uh, you can guess about direction from which this new beginning he is craving that will destroy uh, the oblivion, 2000 and something, uh, 2000 and a half years of oblivion of being to new dawn new dawn through leadership by the way of German people in his case. He was very adamant about it. The philosophy is and, and new thought is, is a German thing, not, not anybody else's. Uh, this is also very important. This is something that people, especially these Anglo-Saxon Anglo-Saxon interpreters of Heidegger, both uh, from academics, uh, mainstream academics, the white nationalists seem to forget now, what does this mean? For Heidegger, metaphysics has to be dissolved in the metapolitics. And this is something that I think every self-conscious white nationalist would applaud and agree with. And I would say that uh, disagreement is really genuine. Heidegger really belongs to what Humphrey called these internet Promethean movements, they are far more in tune with him than his academic interpreters. The reason why this makes me, I wouldn't say happy, but uh, uh, it makes me, uh, let's say, feel justified, is because uh, I despise a lot of what is uh, mainstream in academia today because I think that it is, in its essence it is as crazy as this internet fridge, fringe but it has this political correct veneer where its essence is not visible because one thing is very important and modernity has a lot of forms Heidegger's form of modernity, because Heidegger project is not um, overcoming of modernity, it's absolute affirmation of modernity. And I will go into details, I don't expect you to take my word on it, in the second part, because this needs some demonstration from his texts. Uh, but there are other ways of affirming modernity, uh, just to take one. Uh, it can be, for instance, the way that is based on assumption that uh, pleasure and pain are main principles of, uh, of, of, of human being and that uh, ability to bring the maximum quantity of pleasure 
is uh, a sign that some philosophy comes from the genuine center of being. Uh, I'm talking about he, I'm here talking about Jeremy Bentham, for instance. One could argue grandfather of liberalism, and as some of you maybe know, Jeremy Bentham's life of work was construction, uh, theoretical construction of perfect prism, so-called panopticon whereby the ideal would be uh, ideal would be accomplished of prisoners policing themselves <clears throat> completely on utilitarian and i would even say uh, proto liberal uh, proto liberal principles so heidegger is not the only one here heidegger's way is not ruling uh, the global politics just now there are others that are more universalistic, but are in the in the same vein. Something that Heidegger would, of course, not agree, but I do think that they are all in the same way. They are what uh, Eric Wogelin, whom I quote now from time to time, call Gnostic, uh, Gnostic, uh, Gnostic heresies. Heresies not even towards Christianity, although they are towards Christianity in the end, but also towards classical, classical culture of the West of classical culture mainly i would even add the mediterranean and middle east where philosophy uh, came to pass uh, came to uh, be differentiated somewhat but never entirely from myth <clears throat> and on this way goes the goes heidegger now heidegger sees according to black notebooks heidegger sees two enemies to Western Enschlichkeit, Western humanity. Those two enemies are Christianity and metaphysics. To be more precise, Platonism or Platon, not so much Aristotle as Plato. Uh, because uh, they are most, the, uh, the, they went the further from the true uh, nature of the relationship of man and being and this relationship was supposedly had a uh, this relationship can never be entirely explained and laid out but according to heidegger some pre-socratics uh, also tragic poets of the greeks kind of gave us uh, gave us uh, the the more authentic form of it whereas people like platon and people like jesus christ uh, buried this under the layers and layers of uh, faulty and inauthentic understanding. Now, what is very important here is to notice uh, what for philosopher like Heidegger is the essence of his anti-Semitism that his academic followers are now gushing about. The essence of anti-Semitism is not uh, be, uh, does not stem from racial differences. Like Heidegger is not a racialist. It stems from what he sees as uh, the root of Christianity. Because in Heidegger's view, every philosophy, and he, he obviously sees Christianity as philosophy, which Christianity is not. It has philosophy, but philosophy is not the, the, the main thing in Christianity. And Heidegger's, by the way, Heidegger's <laughs> understanding of Christian, ancient Christian and Middle Ages Christian philosophy was uh, a, a pure counterfeit. I think even that he even had a grasp what it is about, but, but it is my intuition. He simply misinterpreted it because it didn't suit him. But we'll talk about it in the second episode in some detail. Uh, Christianity is based in, in Jewish locale, in Jewish Dasein, what he calls being there in English translation. Uh, Dasein, is, uh, Dasein is intersection of being and understanding. This is what Dasein is. And he never says that man is Dasein, although only man has, has it as far as Heidegger can tell from his phenomenological analysis. 
because Dasein is an articulate or inarticulate understanding of being in general, being with big P. And it is ye mine, it is always mine. This means that uh, it is always individual by, if we are to fall thought of early Heidegger, and also uh, it is always ethnic in a certain sense, or national even. So you cannot have uh, you cannot have some kind of universal universal uh, human design, <clears throat> something that in the thought of classical metaphysics is more of a rule. And Heidegger always tries to show that it wasn't really so, but uh, he is not. I would say he's not very successful with it. One of the reasons. Uh, why uh, why people think that he's battling modernity and why he probably thought that he's doing that while as doing complete opposite is uh, because his uh, provincial and parochial idiosyncrasies, uh, German idiosyncrasies, uh, moreover, from the part of German that he came from. And then you have a sense that when he interprets Aristotle in his very violent translations that kind of like twist and turn uh, philosophers thought into his own terms, you have a feeling that maybe, well, as Aristotle lived so long ago, maybe this archaism is the same. It is not. Nothing of a sort of Heidegger, what Heidegger uh, brings out, I think, existed in antiquity and Middle Ages. And uh, as I said, this is something that we'll have to show in, in, the, in the following episode. Now we'll just put forward these, these condemnations, uh, as I would call them, or my, my judgments on Heidegger, and then we'll justify them in the following. Uh, now, national socialism has an inner greatness, as Heidegger would call it, precisely because it was the political uh, metapolitics, that is to say political metaphysics, something deeper and more dynamic than ideology, mere ideology, it had this in the sense that it is completely localized. This was a German thing. And I think a lot of those white nationalists and outright neo-Nazi whatever types don't understand how localized that was, how one-time offering that was. And the, 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 the way it was destroyed in the end is pretty final. It was all or nothing uh, bet of one precise people. So I, I, I don't believe that uh, if, they, if somebody now wants to build upon historical Nazism to make a second neo-neo-Nazism or post-Nazism, I don't think it would work. In, even if the conditions for that were better, it was too localized. This is a kind of thinking, the thinking that Heidegger shares, this metapolitical thought this counterfeit metaphysics uh, Heidegger shares with Nazis and a great mass of German people at that time unfortunately is something that is in fact incommunicable it is so particular and so tied to a certain what we would call facticitate uh, of, of historical situation uh, so in Heidegger's, when you read Heidegger's Rector's Rede, and in the second episode also we'll read one passage uh, that is very interesting uh, for our subject. Uh, you see always this this tendency to talk about uh, breaking through, about right moment, about either or jump. This all comes uh, from stems from the idea of this. Uh, destiny of one particular people, destiny that is nevertheless messianic because in Heidegger's view, German people and Greeks, ancient Greeks, not Greeks of today, were bearers of Western culture in the true sense, but this Western culture got infected 
by uh, metaphysics, partly by its very nature of how uh, man man's uh, relationship with beings com- being comes uh, to pass. You have to, as Heidegger believes. Uh, where, for all concealment of beings, you have uh, uh, for all revelation of beings, understanding of beings, you get concealment too, because everything is finite, including this principle he calls being. Although, as we uh, will talk about this, also it cannot be finite. You cannot think it as finite. Heidegger rejects the notion of eternity altogether, and this is completely violent, artificial artificial i would say even rape of the natural uh, natural constitution of human intellect you have to think if you think beings and what makes beings beings this thing that makes beings being you cannot think it in finite terms that is to say you are for you who are thinking in finite is are finite you cannot think it as being finite this is what Eric Vogelin called uh, immanent- immanentization of eschaton, where you take this beyond, the transcendence, uh, close it off to any access to, by human intellect, and uh, plant it in the, in the temporal world, in the history. Like there is nothing outside of history, but there is a principle that makes history a history. This is a 100% modern procedure. Anybody who does this cannot find his uh, interlocutor before, I think, late 17th century. And Heidegger is one of those, and it's very uh, self-consciously one of those. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that also. Therefore, uh, when we are talking about this, what uh, guys that... Uh, Humphrey calls dissident rightist. I don't don't know how to call them. Don't uh, really care. I must admit, uh, they are quite right in appropriating Heidegger, and this is also something that will become obvious in the uh, second episode. I think. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, I leave Heidegger safely in their hands, and I would like them to appropriate him because he is their guy. He definitely, 100%, I really believe he is their guy. Also, uh, this means that uh, academia, that part of Western philosophical academia that was not built so much on Anglo-Saxon, so-called analytical Anglo-Saxon philosophy, whereas in fact rather uh, Viennese and German than Anglo-Saxon, but it was appropriated by English universities, Their way of destruction of philosophy uh, should now be transferred in the hands of white nationalists because essence of what they did, they understand. Whereas this analytical uh, strain, uh, this this uh, this now waits for its completion. I think you found it in what we call this postmodernist destruction. People always talk about neo Marxism or cultural Marxism, but it's rather you will rather find roots to this uh, to this destructive uh, identity politics from the left in uh, in ideas that were expressed by analytical philosophy that is to say the very idea that there is no nature to things that you can completely detach logic from reality and make it in a calculus to put things rather simply on my behalf and i say uh, both sides uh, I always considered wrong, and I think that they ejected this traditional metaphysics that Heidegger raves against. They ejected it completely from universities. And uh, therefore, I give Heidegger to white nationalists, and I would accept from white nationalists in return a few degenerates that this uh, calling clearly, uh, clearly. Uh, criticized from Heidegger's standpoint. One of those degenerates that I will happily accept on Kali Tribune would be René Guénon. The others would be even worse degenerates uh, going by the name Thomas Aquinas, Platon, Aristotle, Plotinus, and so on. The exponents of, at the very least, uh, classical metaphysics 
and Christianity. Two main enemies that Heidegger named in his black notebooks. The fact that uh, this is the case is, I think, uh, the point where he and these Promethean rightist internet movements uh, intersect is really what gives them the right to appropriate him for themselves, because that's definitely where he belongs. And I hope that then these academic, uh, these these liberal, tolerant academics who have no qualms about denying the obvious throughout the second half of half century will join them. <laughs> Although I don't think it is going to happen. Anyways, uh, this question, uh, uh, Humphrey's question is prescient uh, precisely for this reason. Because this is not only Humphrey your in- impression, this is really the state of things. This is uh, the state of self-understanding of Western continental philosophical tradition that kind of find uh, its acme in Heidegger. And this acme in Heidegger is the worst sentence it can pronounce upon itself. Now, there were other philosophers that were less famous than Heidegger who did other things, who did things oppositely. One of them is this Eric Wogelin, gentleman, I mentioned from time to time, Eric Wogelin had his own idiosyncrasies, but I think he is one of the best diagnosticians of the modern malaise in philosophy. And he wrote about Heidegger uh, here and there. He was much more systematic in writing against Marx and Nietzsche. I think some of the passages, some of the insights he had are brilliant, nothing short of brilliant and very pointed, and he was never fooled by neither Nazis nor somebody like Heidegger or Husserl and so on and so forth, and when you read him, you get an impression, although he was a man who worked on university, that he, at one point in his life, became aware that the whole history of intellectual culture or intellectual atmosphere or from the times of maybe 18th century early 18th century is completely what he call uh, completely in the sway of modern iteration of his uh, christian heresies or even pre-christian heresies that is to say various forms of madness and he never said it in so many words, uh, among other things, I think, because it is very easy to pronounce such bombastic, uh, albeit, albeit true, sentences, then kind of demonstrate it indirectly, where somebody reading your interpretation all of a sudden realize, realizes where he stands, in what kind of world he is, uh, he is dwelling. And there is a lot of truth to it. So... Uh, in the following, we go into details. I will uh, conclude this episode with just uh, one uh, principle that will be a guideline throughout the second episode that is more interpretative of Heidegger. There is a quite misguided uh, view on metaphysics that is summed up in one sentence that Heidegger loved to repeat ad nauseam. This sentence is usually ascribed originally to Leibniz and it goes something like this. The main metaphysical question, the source of metaphysics, the origin from where it all came is this question. Why is there being and not nothing instead? Or alternatively, uh, why is there a a world and not nothing? This is, in my opinion, and I think this is quite a demonstrable opinion, opinion that you can really prove true, is that Heidegger considered, really considered this to be the question asked by people like Platon, Aristotle, 
even Jesus apparently, uh, Augustine, uh, Thomas, whatever, Descartes. Well, the fact of the matter is uh, this is not true. The main question of metaphysics is why is this cosmos such as it is? When you realize difference between these two questions and why both can be asked at the same time, then you are on the right track to differentiate and decide where will you go. Will you go in the direction of tradition or will you go in the direction of modernity and this its dissolution? Heidegger took the second option and he took it in the guise of taking the first and thereby washed the whole history of uh, of tradition or whole tradition of western metaphysics and christianity in an acid bath of modernity something that will live in infamy as long as his name is <laughs> repeated and he was very, because he was very, very success, successful at it. So this question, differentiation between these two questions and decision and the realization that they cannot stand together, that it is either or with them, will be a guideline in interpreting Heidegger's misinterpretation of some uh, philosophical uh, or metaphysical terminology concretely it will be about some terms we already talked about in Greek that Heidegger claims that were mistrans mistranslated in Latin not in the sense that somebody who, that Boetius who most, most probably translated them uh, didn't know didn't speak good Greek but wa was a design of a different form uh, than Greeks because Greek design is congenial with German whereas Latin design even of the Latin Christianity and Latin Europe seems to be congenial with Roman invaders I would say something just I'm throwing in uh, for your consideration because Heidegger likes to throw in such things and he makes the whole philosophy out of it I am not but it is interesting thing to note there is a very strong anti-Roman sentiment even anti-Roman culture or Roman even Roman peoples in Heidegger that is noticeable but these two questions will be a guideline and will show how they don't jive so to speak and how uh, the attempt to um, exchange one for another uh, brings the, uh, the opposite results. Thank you for your attention and Hanfei, thank you to, uh, for your question. This is Branko Malic signing out. <laughs>